Okay, so let's start with a bit of a history lesson here. We'll go through data in relationship to how it, it comes about. So we'll look back at the 1920s, 1950s, where we'll, we'll quickly get up to current time and look at how data has changed over the years. And in some cases, it hasn't really changed a whole lot. So this history lesson is really much is very oriented at chemical processes and chemical engineering. Uh, so it's a bit biased to that, that line. But the way we look at things is that in this time frame, when engineers worked on their processes, they collected a very small number of data sets. So the number of columns, we'll use the standard K for notation on the number of columns, very small. Uh, in fact, the way that they choose those columns was they use their engineering knowledge and know this variable is going to be useful to me. This other variable is going to be useful to me. And these two variables measure totally different things. So they would pick those columns that go into the data set X here very carefully so that each column captures something new or interesting about the process. Today's approach is very different. We just blindly go to a distillation column and put a temperature probe on every tray. So we get 50 temperature sensors, 50 temperature measurements. 50 columns of temperatures. But there's a lot of redundancy in that. Back then, a temperature probe is extremely expensive and has to be recorded manually by some guy writing out the value from it. So they would put maybe one temperature probe at the top and one at the bottom of the distillation column, but certainly not what we do today on every tray. So they would choose their number of columns very carefully because the data was expensive to get and expensive to archive. All of this was done by hand. Uh, as a result, those small number of columns means you can easily use tools like scatter plots, time series plots for each column. You can build control charts. We'll, we'll recap control charts later on in this course, but those of you that have taken 4C3 know exactly what a SHUART or EWMA chart is. You can build those control charts on every single one of these columns because every column contains unique information that contributes to your knowledge of the process. You can use multiple linear regression as well. And the assumption with multiple linear regression is that this matrix X is a full rank, which you will satisfy if every column contains new independent pieces of information. Okay. So all these classical tools, scatter plots, time series, Schuart charts, multiple linear regression, these classical statistical tools work beautifully on data from that period of time because they satisfy the assumptions. The data was small, number of columns, and independent, and low noise. Okay, because if they measure the temperature, the guy will be looking at the temperature probe and he'll probably take the average temperature over a period of time. Now we, we just plug it right into the computer and it measures an instantaneous temperature. There's usually no error, uh, or there's usually some error in that value. So that situation persisted for about 40, 50 years um, for those types of data. And you generate, just to go back here, small columns, but n can be pretty large. So n is your number of rows. If you're on a chemical process, every row is a new sample of time. Maybe every hour, the person takes a new set of readings from the process. So n can be arbitrarily long. The opposite of that is to have a small number of measurements but many columns. So this happens most frequently when we deal with spectral data. So what's a spectral measurement? If I take some sort of object and I put it in on my lab countertop and I have an <laughs> in infrared probe that puts light of a certain wavelength lambda onto that object there's some transmittance through that object, and there's also some reflectance back. Okay? And the NIR works mostly by measuring that return value, and sometimes you'll have a sensor panel over here that measures the transmitted value, but most often we measure the return signature. And what we'll plot then is this absorbance back, or well, absorbance can be calculated from 
that object and different wavelengths. So we'll vary the wavelength. So the wavelength is very rapidly changed from low to high, scans through many wavelengths at, at different, maybe in this particular data set, the spacing was every two nanometers, and it records the spectral signature of that particular product. In this case, this plot I have here, these were 400 tablets, and there's many, many columns. I don't know the exact number, I think it's six, 700 columns of wavelengths here. So every tablet was scanned at, at, at the center point, and, and as you can see, at, the tablets come from the same family, so they show the same peaks, but there's some variation from peak, uh, tablet to tablet. And then there's a period here of the spectrum that's noise. There's no real information in that region of the spectrum. Most of our information is up here, and here, and certain wavelengths. So spectral data comes from one particular sample across many wavelengths, and then we'll have different samples. The new trend in the chemical industry is to put this near infrared probe right in line in your, in your processing equipment. So here's a pipe, and I've got some fluid moving through that pipe. This near infrared probe is measuring a signature the spectral signature of the pros of the material passing through that pipe. So it's, it's a liquid, it can also be a solid. Uh, these probes are often put in solid processing lines. And we're measuring the spectral signature of the material passing the tip of that probe. And we get a new spectrum every five seconds, ten seconds, and this absorbance value that we have here on the y-axis will record this entire spectrum. Let's say we're sampling every five seconds and there's 600 values here as an example. We'll archive those 600 values every five seconds in our database. So we're collecting many columns and over time, or many columns over tablets, or many columns over samples. Okay? So that's a spectral Data, uh, data source. And we, we usually categorize the, the type of spectrum based on the wavelength length, so near infrared, UV, and other and spectrum are available. This, this is the most complete signature you can get on the product. So it's a complete chemical signature. In many cases, this type of signature is expensive, this probe. So as as a shortcut, what we, we do as engineers, that we don't want to spend a lot of money on our systems, believe me, companies don't want to spend a lot of money on anything. Um, they will rent one of these sensors for a week or two, measure a whole lot of data, then they find the peaks that give meaningful information. So let's say the peak at 1200 and the peak at 1450. And then they'll just put a sensor in here that measures only at lambda 1200 and only at lambda 1450. So now they're not collecting 600 values per unit time, they're collecting only two values because they've determined that those two positions along the x-axis give the most information. We'll talk a bit later on about how they figured that out. So that's spectral data. In a chemical refinery, we have a large number of rows and small columns. So <laughs> this is relatively speaking. It's a large N. N is in the millions or the millions. K is tens of thousands. Okay. So in a refinery, we'll easily have 20, uh, 2,000 to 5,000, sometimes 10,000 variables each column in that data set. So one of those 10,000 columns so now all we're doing is we're changing our data set as follows. We're calling these tags. And those tags could be temperature, pH, flow rate, etc. Measurements from our chemical process. And if we just take a, a, a small distillation column, this is a, a case study I worked on with Petro Canada in 2002-2003. They had 35 temperatures on the distillation column, 5 to 10 flow rates, 10 pressure measurements, 
And then there were five columns of calculated values. So they calculated certain numbers based on these. So they could do a heat, a heat balance or a mass balance. And then the left hand side and the right hand side of the heat and mass balances gets added as a new column. So we can add mass balance here, energy balance, the derived quantity from the raw data. And those columns are calculated by the computer. So when the computer measures temperature, pH, and flow rate, it says, well, there's also a calculation stored in my database. I need to go calculate the mass balance from the various flow rates, and need to go calculate the energy balance from the various temperatures. And it does that calculation and stores the value as if it was measured on the process, though it never really was measured. It's just that it's a calculated value. It's added into your database. So on those processes, we'll have on a moderate size refinery, 5,000, 10,000 for one of the big oil refineries of data tags, and N is large. It's, I see data systems with once per second sampling, five second sampling. My company, that's our, our preference, is five seconds, though some processes I deal with are extremely slow moving, so we will only sample once every 15 seconds because people from IT phone us and tell us, you're filling up our database, you're running out of our data space, can you not sample slower? So, okay, we'll go from 5 to 15 to appease IT, even though hard drives are so cheap. But um, that on, a, on, a, on these processes, it's not uncommon to record about 100 megabytes of data per second if you're sampling on a pretty large scale of process. Okay. Now, we'll introduce this concept of our data matrix being called X. But when we're making predictions of other quantities, we'll call that quantity we're going to predict Y. And so we'll have M columns here. M usually smaller than K. So it's a narrow data matrix for predicting fewer, fewer variables, um, but the same number of rows. So always N rows of both X and Y. This is a standard notation we'll see throughout the course. Okay, let's uh, talk about three data sets. Very common now from image data. Image data is a three-dimensional data block. Okay? If I can take my digital camera from my cell phone, I take a picture, I am storing on my cell phone's memory card the three data cube. My JPEG file, the BMP, or PNG file, whatever format you use, underneath that is a 3D cube of data. How many of you have used data, image data on your computer and actually played with the numbers? Okay. Yeah, sort of one, two. Okay, so I'm going to show you a bit in MATLAB what image data looks like. Before I do that though, this is the mental picture you need to have in your head. So I take a photo. Here's my X and Y spatial view on, onto the photo. So if I take a photo of the mountain, it's over there, and the ocean over there, X and Y represents that. That's one channel, but there's usually three channels on a, on a full color image. There's the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. Okay? And every one of these locations is a pixel. So there's pixel 1, 1, because it represents x, x1, y1. And we have a r1, 1, g1, 1, and a b1, 1 value. So three numbers. That represents that one pixel, one value for every channel. Okay, and these numbers, R, G, and B, they're not just any types of numbers. They're all almost always integers between zero and two hundred and fifty-five. So the people over here will tell you why that is. Okay, because they're integers. They're stored in eight bytes. Uh, and so you, one pixel is stored per byte. So those three numbers take up three bytes. Okay? Because you each one of these numbers on the storage is one byte. And stored as an entry between 0 and 255. So that's the mental picture you need to have. Let's take a look at an actual example. 
<coughs> so this image was recently released um, showing the, I think this is Baffin Island in Canada, if I remember correctly, and it's showing you this white is not cloud, it's snow, it's melt water coming off the island. So this, this picture was part of an article, I think, of global warming or something like that. So we get a lot of melt water, and these swirls are eddies in the ocean currents being formed by the melt water coming off. The only piece of cloud we have is that up there. Okay. So this up here, this top pixel here, that's snow. This is ocean and cloud, and then, let me just yeah. Okay. So that's cloud, ocean, and uh, sorry, ice, ocean, cloud. So the reason why I can emphasize that is because I'm just going to look at the top few rows of that image to show you what the pixel values look like for each one of those features. So if I take this JPEG I just downloaded off uh, Wikipedia here from that link, and I go to MATLAB, I can say MATLAB has this command, I am read, read, read this JPEG. Okay. And I'm reading it into a variable called capital X. And if I look at X, it's a 6,000 rows, 4,400 columns by three. So it's a 3D data cube, 6,000 rows in this dimension. I'm oh, sorry, X, Y, sorry. So it reports this one first. So this is 6,000. This is 4, 4, 0. And this is 3. Okay. If I was reading a near infrared camera image, I would have multiple way, multiple channels uh, in that three dimension. So there it takes up roughly 8 megabytes and it's stored as integers. So let's take a look at the top 10 pixels in the top corner there. So x1 to 10 x1 to 10, all columns. Okay. So the first 100 pixels in the image from the top corner, the first 10 rows, the first 10 columns. Basically looking at this chunk of data up here. So those values are 70, 60, between 60 and 70 in the red layer, between 80 and 90 in the, in the uh, G layer, and in the B layer, they're higher up. Okay. If I take a look at what that is visually, so there's a command in MATLAB that you can say, show me the image. That's the color that that three, those, that, that 10 by 10 cube represents. So when R is set to those values in the 70s, G is set to those values in the 80s and 90s, and B is that value, I get this kind of bluish color. Okay. If I move over in the image, um, and in fact, I want to take a look at this region here, so image, I'm looking at the first 100 rows and columns, 2,300 odd. So it's a much darker ocean up there. Remember, the, the middle of the picture was ocean, and there's a little dot here in the ocean, a little white speck. That's probably a floating piece of ice, because each pixel is roughly, I think, 10 meters by 10 meters, geographically on the ground. So that could easily be a piece of ice, or maybe it's an artifact in the image, a piece of noise that we have to deal with later on. But if we take a look at the, those pixel values, you can see those numbers are much lower this time, in the 20s, 20s, for all the layers. They're roughly 20, 20, 20 for R, G, and B. So indicating we've got a much darker pixel than the previous pixel, it was much lighter blue. So it's no surprise then that if I have a pixel that's 0, 0, 0, it's pure black. Okay? What would the pixel look like that's pure blue? Blue? Blue pixel, <laughs> multiple choice. 
zero zero two fifty five zero two fifty five zero two fifty five zero two fifty five. It's zero. A pure blue pixel would be zero zero two hundred fifty five. Okay. A pure red pixel. Anyone? Zero zero. Zero zero. Nice. Okay. And then you can make any other color in between by combining those RG and values. Okay. In fact, if we look at that top corner of the image up there, that piece of cloud, what would you expect the pixels to look like? All, so pure white would be 255, 255, 255. Let's go take a look at what that cloud is. Um, So 4, 4, uh, sorry, 4, 3, 80 to 4, 6. Okay? So 230s, close enough, right? So 230 in the red channel, 230 in the blue channel, and 230 in the blue channel. Actually, Is this the way like, values of this pixel will be to recognize what is what and stuff like that? It's exactly what they use. So when you're when a computer is looking at a picture, it doesn't see this, it just sees those numbers. Okay? So you have to then convert those numbers and do something with them to locate features in the image. So I could very crudely say, show me all pixels that are smaller than 50, 50, 50, and refine all the darker features in the image. And so, and so we'll talk much, much more about image processing. And I've, I've written a piece of software way back when in MATLAB that use for analyzing this data multivariately. But I just want you to understand that image data is nothing more than numbers. And once you've got numbers, you can do anything with it. PCA, PLS, least squares, any sort of calculation. Because now you're just dealing with data. Okay? So that's all that image data is. Let's just go back here then. In that 3D data cube, left to right, spatially, top to bottom, and then you've got wavelengths. So for a camera, image, red, green, blue, you've got three of those wavelengths. So you could have more. A more expensive camera, uh, it's a CCD that's in here, is a very cheap CCD. In actual fact, it's only recording one layer, and then it produces a, a clever algorithm and creates three layers for you. So when you're using your cheap camera phone, you're not getting a true color image. You're getting what's called a beta reconstruction of that grayscale image. Okay. A true color camera will cost a lot, of, lot more money, about four or five times the price, because it has a true red sensor, a true green sensor, and a true blue sensor, and builds each channel individually. A true near-infrared camera has multiple sensors that are sensitive to different wavelengths, but a cheap color camera like this is not going to do that for you. Okay. In fact, it just uses pieces of plastic cleverly arranged to filter out reds, greens, and blues, but it's a single channel that gets reconstructed mathematically to three. Okay, but that's a detail. At the end, you do get three channels and you can deal with them. That's image data. If you get the video, you've got a true color image progressing over time. So you've added a fourth dimension to this data cube. The video is a stack of 4D numbers. That's all it is. Okay. And as you can imagine, just if we look back here to MATLAB, see how redundant this is? I mean, this is a huge resolution image, 4,000 pixels by 6,000 pixels, so eight, 8 megabytes in my computer, taken by some sort of satellite. A lot of data, but see how little information there is? These numbers are all in the same region, roughly the same. Okay. So, if I tell you this number, to a good approximation, the neighboring numbers are going to be the same. Right? So there's a very high redundancy in this image. Spatially. So this is the x, y direction. So this pixel is more to the left, this pixel is more to the right. So spatially, there's a lot of redundancy in that image. And if I took that satellite image over time and watched the ice melting, evolving over time, that 4D data cube contains a lot of redundancy well in the time direction. Okay. So spatially and in time, the huge redundancy, lots of noise, little signal. That's the key thing. We're not learning anything new from every single pixel. We're getting a lot of redundant information. Okay, 
we're taking a whirlwind tour through different types of data. So we've looked at image data, we've looked at spectral data. Let's take a look at a very important other data type, the batch data. So for the non-chemical engineers in the room, there's very few of you, so I hope you're not all too bored. Basic principle of a batch reactor, nice big, usually stainless steel vessel that just sits there and recharge the reactant. So these pipes are used to add water, reagent one, reagent two. We add various chemicals or um, reagents to this reactor, and then we follow a recipe. Basically, it's kitchen cooking. On your kitchen countertop, you're making pancakes, you add your eggs, you add your flour, you add your milk, and you beat, or you agitate your the mixture. Turn that agitator on and let it run for X minutes. You may need to put heat into the system or take heat out of the system through the jacket. So we pump cooling water in or heating water in, depending on what we need to, whether we need to heat or cool. And we let the recipe go for a certain time. Maybe we need 50 minutes and then we need to stop, add another ingredient or another reagent to the system, keep stirring, etc. So we follow a fixed protocol. In my company, we have batches that run 24 hours, some are 36 hours, and this, the recipe literally says, turn on for 10 hours, and the operator turns it on and goes away. And, and then that operator is assigned to other processes while that 10 hours has to elapse. Just because that's the amount of time it takes for the chemical reactions to occur in that system. Some batches I work with are, are short, they're like in the order of a few minutes. So you fill, discharge, fill, discharge, fill, discharge. But mostly we fill, run this reactor recipe, at the end we pump this out and it goes to the next stage in the flow sheet. Whatever that. Maybe another batch system, maybe it just probably gets packaged and then sold to the customers. Okay? So that's what batch data, a batch reactor looks like. The data we get from those systems, let's say we've got four tags in this case. So coming back to this word tags that we had up here earlier, we're collecting or measuring the level in the tank. It's a solid black, black line. So for the first, this is in minutes on this axis, for the first 170 minutes, we're filling the tank. That's all that, that that recipe phase says. Fill the tank. It takes a long time to fill it. The agitator sits at a flat line here, 10 RPMs. The drier temperature set point and the drier temperature itself, so the drier temperature uh, set point is up here. The drier temperature just sits there. It's actually not really under control. We're not controlling the temperature, it just sits there. The next phase says, let's take a look, we're turning the agitator on to 30 RPM, and at the end of the phase, we, we wrap down. So that's phase two of this reactor. While that agitator is going, we notice that the temperature is going up because this point when we open the, the heating jacket on the batch reactor, so now the contents of the batch are heating. It's a very linear line indicating it's probably under feedback control. The feedback controller has been told, ramp up the temperature by, let's say, one degree, uh, two degrees per minute. That's probably what the feedback control has been called for. Okay? Then the next phase is temperature ramps out. So temperature cools down, the agitator also goes low, but then notice at the end there's this kind of ramp up again. So the recipe, whoever's designed the recipe has figured this is the best way to make the product. So that recipe is pre-programmed to go slow and then after a certain period of time ramp up and then ramp that back down to zero. At the end of this third phase the batch is discharged. Okay. So let's assume we've got these four tags and we're sampling the value of each tag every minute. So by the end of the batch, there's 325 minutes have elapsed. We have 325 samples for every tag. So our matrix looks as follows. 325 rows by four columns. So column one, two, three, and four, and row one up to 325. That's the data we've collected by the end of this single batch. Okay. We 
discharge the batch, we run the batch again, the second batch, the third batch, the fourth batch, because we're making this product every day after 325 minutes of elapsed, if we empty out the batch, maybe there's a cleaning step, but then we start to make the next batch, the third batch, the fourth batch. So this is batch one, it's there. Batch two, there's another block, also four columns, also 325 minutes, because it's been programmed to be exactly that long. Batch three, batch four, batch five. What we can do then is stack those data in the queue. So if I take this plane of data and I rotate it this way, put it that way for you, that's what it looks like. So every flat plane there represents one batch. So this is the top plane is batch one. There's the variable, the tag, tag one, tag two, tag three, and tag four. Batch one, two, three, four, five, up to one of the name. So Everyone's clear on that data structure. We'll use this data a lot and, and come back to batch data quite quickly. So this is the real-time data from the batch, but before that, we actually have some other information. Every batch we run, we have what we call Z, initial conditions. We know maybe for the first batch, our first column might be the name of the operator who was responsible for that batch. So their name goes in that column. The second column might be the amount of material charged to the batch reactor before we even turned it on. Column three might be a chemical analysis of that raw material that we charge to the batch, okay, etc. So we can have multiple columns for every batch, one row per batch in Z. Corresponding to every row, we also have a plane of data here, with the real-time data from the batch. And then at the end, we do some sort of analysis on the batch. We send a sample of that batch to the laboratory, take some measurements on it. Every row over there represents some value from our lab, maybe the viscosity or the particle size distribution, which is the, the critical quality variable from the batch. Okay, so plenty of data from batch systems. <clears throat> and that that batch data set is also a kind of, well it is, it's a multi-block data set. Indicating that the total data we have for the system is not in one nice single matrix like this, or like this. We don't have one nice block of data. We have multiple blocks of data. We have our initial conditions, we have our batch data, we have our final conditions, and some of these blocks may be three-dimensional. And I could easily add more blocks from any of the upstream units prior to this batch because they may have an influence on the final product. Okay, so multi-block data sets, that's the defining characteristic of data in this time. From, from about the year 2000 onwards, most of the data sets we deal with are multi-block data sets. We don't just get our numbers from one device. We get it from a multitude of devices. We have to do a lot of pre-processing calculations to manipulate our data into a nice, easy to use form. Then we do pre-processing, and then we get to PCA or PLS or these squares. But there's so much extra work because we're getting all these new data types coming through. Okay. So sometimes you'll see this buzzword, data fusion, that's just another way of saying multiple block data. So combining data from multiple sources. Okay, so I'll argue then that the, that the main purpose of this course is how do we get something from this information? How do we improve our processes? How do we extract value from this data? So before we break, I just quickly want you, you don't have to come up here to the front. You can just, I want you to firstly for a minute or two, discuss with the person to the left or to the right of you either in groups of two or three, whatever's convenient for you. Talk amongst yourself, and between the two or three of you, I want you to then afterwards, I'll give you a minute, and then afterwards, each group will tell the class what was the last data set they looked at, and why you were looking at that data. What was the purpose of you looking at the data set? Okay, so I'll give you a minute or two to discuss it, and then tell the class about the data, but I'm very interested in 
what you are trying to use that data for. Okay, because that's going to tie into the discussion we're going to have after the break. So go ahead, go for it. Okay, go for it. Okay, so we're going to have a group up here at the flat go first. Why don't you guys tell us about out of the three of them, they discuss various data. I just want to give one, one example of what that's going to be. So go ahead, guys. We were working on uh, the batch process data, the uh, process. And the objective is to monitor the batch process over the time. So how is it evolving? So uh, basically, it can be classified as normal or abnormal. But we go for uh, something more, and then we classify the batch as a zero to one kind of the analysis. So it's a point five. It's not normal or abnormal. But it's like something in between the normal and abnormal. And then the second thing we did is like uh, do the use the data for quality prediction. So what would be the best quality at the end uh, once the batch will complete? Because usually the fermentation process is goes for like uh, two days, three days, like so. So when the process is running, we use that uh, data up to that particular time and then uh, predicting the quality. But we haven't used it for any, you know, the controlling the batch process. So it's basically the monitoring for the batch process. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Next So the, the last that I said that I uh, worked with was a uh, kind of delay analysis. So uh, taking a look at a production-wide, uh, what's happening in a plant. So we're recording the type of delays that are happening, like what is causing production to go down how long it's going for, the shift that it's on, and a variety of different other factors. And we try to take a look at this data to make correlations to really figure out uh, if it's a certain point in time of the day, if it's temperatures outside, if it's a shift that's not doing good, or are there different delays that are piggybacking on each other, causing a bunch of different problems. Great, thank you. Thanks, good. So um, it was heat treatments to the metal that I had. I had an aluminum piece of metal. We were doing heat treatments and we're basically finding out the ideal temperature and the ideal time that we wanted to heat treat something at just to get a certain type of like tensile strength. Great. The last page that I looked at was because I'm such a nerd and I record all my GPS calls wherever I drive with my car. <laughs> I record GPS going to work and back and I take different routes every day and I do experiments which route is the shortest route. So if I take the 407, I can plot on a map for you that 
The 407 leads to the shortest time, but also the sh lowest variance. I guarantee to get to work 33 minutes plus or minus three minutes every day if I take the 407. <laughs> and is that worth driving through the back routes of Milton on the highway, I don't know what it is, but it's Trafalgar Road, and then Britannia, and then along Derry Road. There the average time is 44 minutes, 45 minutes, so it's about 10 to 15 minutes longer, but the variance can be used. Some, one day it took me an hour and 10 minutes, another day during the summertime when everyone's away on holidays, it took me the same time as it took me on the 407 to take back routes. So longer time, but huge variance. So now I can decide, well, am it worth paying $250 a month for the 407, backwards and forwards every day, or is it worth spending 12 minutes extra in the car, plus or minus 10 minutes, as I sit behind a large piece of farm equipment going 40 k's an hour. Okay, so that's my data set. Optimal route finding. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah. Okay, so this summer I was working for a company that was uh, interested in reducing like their carbon emissions. So what they did was uh, the, a, a group of us, uh, including some senior engineers, they came up with different ways to reduce carbon emissions and then they applied it to their data set to predict how much it will go down. So they had consumptions of all different kinds of fuels and in different parts of the plant and then we predicted where uh, and how much carbon emissions would go down if we applied uh, certain technologies. The last data set I looked at uh, contained uh, open loop step, step test data uh, for various uh, outputs in my in an air conditioning system, and I used this step test data uh, to formulate AR space models. So it was, it was to form the uh, the uh, regressing regression vector or regressor vector in the AR models. So you were trying to make some some prediction from that model. What was the purpose of the model? The purpose of the model is to implement it in the controller, but in, so it, it would capture the essential local dynamics, but not all the, like, just the local dynamics. Okay, great controller. Okay, next group. Okay, so the last set of data that Charlene and I looked at was in our undergrad senior design project where we had a whole bunch of wastewater treatment data from uh, some wastewater streams, we had a bunch of flow rates and concentrations and stuff like that in order to design a wastewater treatment plant that brought the water we inspect, as well as some equalization basins to deal with peaking and flow changes. So what does the last part? Like an equal, uh, so we had to deal with the flow bear variance by designing equalization basins so that they could have flow, but still be within the specification. Exactly, okay. just to make the plant perform more, I guess. certain measurements for the Lekker Carb Furnace, and yeah, it, it gives you like a bunch of like data for each heat to batch process. So what I'm actually doing every day is like I have to filter like like some of the heats that give like good data. And from that I can do parameter estimation since the more the more heats I have I'll get better like parameter estimation and that will actually run into like robustness of, of the model. What do you use that model for? So for the electric arc terminus? Yeah, so yeah, we have like inputs and like different off gas like composition measurements. Okay. So I use to use fan data and then I can actually do parameter estimation for my model. Okay, and, and then once you have those parameters, once I have those parameters, then I can actually predict predict what the fan can perform like right there. Great. Okay, next group. Yeah. Um, the last set of data that is uh, was uh, work with was the uh, continuous process data from uh, polypropylene loop reactors. Uh, uh, I developed a, a dynamic process model for the reactor uh, so that uh, uh, so that uh, to to predict the map for index of the polymer produced. Uh, in conventionally, the map for index is uh, experimentally measured once in every four hours, but uh, by having the the dynamic process model we can predict the uh, 
uh, the map for index in real time. Uh, next group. Oh, so you all fall part of that? Yeah. Okay. So the next, the last group. Yeah. yeah the last data set I looked at was the cooking of gasoline data set. So I have a bunch of components, and I have to make a bunch of uh, different types of gasoline, and I have like several time periods, and I was able to say, that, okay, I can blend a little bit of product A, product B, or product C, and this time period and have a particular recipe, and then, like at the end of the day, I'm just blending. At the end of all the time periods, I'm blending the same amount, but I'm blending different on each day in each different solution. I was able to find several recipes out of the um, out of this technique that I used to solve the problem. So basically, I was looking at if I'm going to use this recipe, why is it better than another recipe? Similarly, for quality of gasoline, if this recipe is better, this is the quality. Is it better? Okay, so some sort of, usually when we say is it better, there's some element of optimization. Yes, yes. Okay. Optimizing the recipe of the taxi But, but uh, well, optimizing what about minimum? Uh, production cost. Okay. Okay, so this is great. This covers so many of the topics that we want to look at. Uh, and I just wanted to capture this because after after the break, we'll, we'll break now quickly for another 10 minutes. I'm going to show you how I categorize most of these prediction, pro, uh, these data analysis problems. Usually what we've looked at here fall into one of five categories. So after the break, we'll look at those categories and then we'll look at how latent variable methods can be used to achieve those objectives. So let's meet back again at